Paul. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> let, let her speak first. <laughs> so thanks everyone uh, for coming. Thanks Paul for uh, for introducing and moderating. Um, I'll go straight to screen share and we'll we'll go from there if if you don't mind. So let me just sure. uh, let me just do that. Love the mic setup. It's like we're on a talk show. Or just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah call-in show. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Very good. So the. Uh, as you know, the, my talk is on the case for non-derivative OER or how we can work with non-derivative um, CC licensed products in OER. So let's get straight to things. I feel that uh, non-derivative um, licensed items are a bit stigmatized in the open uh, educational field. As we see from this slide from David Wiley, um, they get the big red X when it comes to revision and remixing because of the um, inability to adapt or to modify and to use a quotation that I've taken from a blog post at Creative Commons. The no derivatives license is restrictive in the sense of adapting. You can't even translate or update things like that. So it's, it is, it is restrictive. It does have restrictions that there's no doubt about that, but there is a kind of the way it's stigmatized a little bit, I find is a bit, I don't want to say it's annoying, but it, I think it goes a little too far. So for example, this is just a slide from a presentation from Cable Green. And here we see OER, the, 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 the licensed products uh, through like the, the permissions granted through Creative Commons that are good, get the green, <laughs> and the ones that you know, red are you know, not OER, very stressed. There's a real divide there. And it's uh, my concern is that that kind of stigmatizes OER, uh, certain products that could be part of OER in a broader sense and um, might serve to dissuade people to be involved in open education, which I think would be a shame. Uh, as an analogy to this, I want to look at the, um, uh, this blog post from um, Bridget Vezina of uh, Creative Commons. And she was talking, that this is from this year, from April, 2020, and she was talking about open access. So uh, uh, the, the situation with open access research and how it cannot be considered OER. And or it cannot be considered, no, sorry, non-derivative work shouldn't be used as open access. Pardon me for getting a little confused there. And the, the reason is because they restrict the use of reuse of content. And as she puts it, cur curtail the opportunity of researchers to contribute to the advancement of knowledge. Um, by forbidding adaptations, it flies in the face of the ethos of academic research. It harms researchers. I'm not sure it actually does harm researchers. It's true that it restricts what they can do with some of the material if it does have a Creative Commons ND license. However, so much of research has even greater restrictions and we make use of it. We have access through our libraries as university, uh, if we're affiliated with universities and colleges, we have access through libraries and things. There's, it's restricted, it's not as open for sure. She refers in her blog post to the um, open access recommendations of the Budapest Open Access Initiative. And uh, looking at those, it's true that they, they see, you know, and they're talking here about open access and research. So they're talking about gratis access and Libre access and all of those um, terms that they use on that side of the fence. But the, the, the point that they make in their recommendations is we should achieve what we can when we can. So while CC BY is considered really, uh, something to be uh, aspired to. The recommendations don't say it only, it can only be that. It, it, it's more like, let's take the glass half full, let's get what we can when we can and, and, and progressively move forward in that regard. And when we look, more importantly, when we look at the Budapest Open Access Initiative, uh, the actual um, declaration from 2002, this point is, is very important. The only constraint on reproduction and distribution and the only role for copyright in this domain should be to give authors control over the integrity of their work and the right to be properly acknowledged and cited. Two important points here. The right to be properly acknowledged and cited, and that's in all CC licenses. That's the, that's the attribution, um, the buy part. But to give authors control over the integrity of their work if they've created something that they want to keep whole in some fashion is the author's 
it's it that belongs to the author that that needs to belong to the author that control over integrity which seems to run a it seems to run counter to the notion of using cc by in the open access side of things because with cc by you can adapt mod uh, modify reuse revise all of those things you can do all of those things so i think there's a bit of an issue there and that uh, analogy um it has served others as well. So we have uh, S. Mishra who wrote in Distance Education a couple of years ago, talking, uh, he, he, he was uh, referring to a number of issues with open education that he thought needed to be addressed. And he, um, he, he did refer to the open access initiative, the, as uh, I've pointed out here, the middle quotation shows that the context is the research rights and very few authors of research would like their work to be changed. That's probably quite true. And so we need to be able to preserve content integrity. That's why, um, that's why uh, the ND can help with that. But he makes two other points that the, the, in his article, which isn't really focused on this topic per se, but it, it comes up and so he mentions a couple of things. And the one at the top quotation is, if we want OER to succeed, we have to think about it. We need to develop policies that allow copyright holders to decide how they want to share. We have that with Creative Commons, but of course, Creative Commons, we have six licenses to choose from. It, doesn't, it may not have all the personal choice that we would wish. Uh, also, the, he makes the third point, well, you know, okay, so we don't get all five R's. We don't get the, um, we don't get the remixing and the revising, but we get the other three R's and ain't that good enough. That's basically what he's saying. He doesn't say <laughs> ain't, but I do. You know, three out of five R's ain't bad. And that's something to think about with regard to our definition of OER and using the five R's. Do we need all five? I put the question out there. I'm not, I don't, you know, but I, but I wonder about that. Do we need it in all cases? Is that something that we need to be thinking about? So I think this is especially an issue with the way teaching is changing. Maybe it's not changing. Maybe it's just we're becoming more explicit about the different ways of teaching or different aspects of teaching. So we, we generally think of teaching about the traditional approach would be teaching as the transmission of knowledge to students. Received knowledge, we take it, we maybe change it a little bit or make it, you know, help it be more understandable to the students we have in our classroom and we pass it along. It's kind of like we as the instructors just pass it along. But that's changing. And especially in, uh, with uh, communities like uh, open educational communities where people are thinking more about different ways of being more progressive about how they approach teaching, there's a couple of things that are changing. So in some cases, we think about teaching about creating knowledge and sharing it with students. Now, this, is, this has often been the way at universities is um, the, the role of the instructor, of the faculty member is to, to, to do research, to, to work on certain topics, and then to pass that knowledge along to his or her students. You know, that's, that's been going on for, you know, centuries. And we also are coming more and more into a, a situation where teaching is about co-creating knowledge with students. And there we have examples of, you know, the uh, creation of literary anthologies, uh, uh, open, uh, these open, um, educational uh, resources that are literary anthologies like Janet Ward's for Spanish and Robin DeRosa's for American literature, early American. And that's a, those are examples and there are more and more of them almost every day it seems where we're co-creating with students. And there we have to ask ourselves a question, well, for co-creating with students, for bringing their voices into the, into the knowledge that we're distributing, is there a need to be preserving those voices in there, in, in, in keeping those voices integral, or keeping the integrity of those voices, the wholeness of them? And I think these questions are going to be raised more and more uh, with regard to the relationship between how we license uh, our work and open educational resources. So why would, what would be the reasons for creating non-derivative OER? Obviously to share, we all want to, it, when we're interested in open education, we want to share what we're doing with others. And sometimes we, we want to share original ideas and we want to keep the originality of that idea whole. That's, that, uh, that's an important aspect sometimes of what, we're, of what we're sharing. That could be a reason for a non-derivative license. 
content integrity is similar to that, although it might be the, the integrity of the whole product that we've created. Maybe there's something about it that we feel needs to be kept as is. That might be a reason. Sometimes we're dealing with very complicated material and the explanations need to be maintained so that there can't be, or to, to, to avoid misrepresentation, innocent misrepresentation, not willful, but just simply, you, you know, think about it when you, you probably played that whispering game where somebody starts, whispers a sentence to their neighbor and it goes, passes down a chain. And by the end, it's a completely different sentence than the beginning. Education can be like that. We can, as we pass things along from one person to the next, it can be misunderstood. And perhaps we want to prevent that. Preserving student voices, as I previously mentioned, the notion of keeping the student voice, if they've contributed something to, a, to an item that, that we're working on with them, maybe the value of that item is because there's a, an original student voice there. Do we want that to be changed? We may not want that to be changed. And then sensitive material. If we're dealing with sensitive material, politically charged or uh, material that uh, causes, can cause upset or can cause you know, real debate, and uh, concern within our educational communities, it may be important that the material be preserved in a, in a, in a whole form, in, an, in, like in its original form, in order to make sure that we have exactly, that we know exactly what was meant by something and we don't misinterpret it somehow, especially when it's very sensitive. So I have a couple of suggestions about how we might proceed. And, in this, in this approach, you know, I, I basically I give four kind of ways we might do this. We might just wave the white flag of surrender and say, well, we'll just leave it well enough alone. I, most of the things that I license, I license with CC BY, this presentation, for example. And uh, I do that and in the hope that people will use it well and use it properly or properly being that they'll represent my ideas uh, as best they can when they, if they reuse or adapt the material in any way. We might talk about expanding CC licenses, but there I, there I wouldn't be, I don't think that would be the most fruitful approach. The CC, uh, the Creative Commons regime is really good and it's really well thought out and that's taken years of legal and other kinds of expertise to arrive at. And I don't think there's much, <laughs> what's the hope of making many changes there? I'm not sure there are, but it's a possibility perhaps, but I'm not sure it's the most fruitful route to take. Endorsing more flexible OER solutions might be the way to approach that. And that might be, and I put a little quotation there from my uh, paraphrase of, from my abstract, is devotion to the letter of the five R's law, harming the spirit of openness, which that law tries to preserve. Are we preventing people from sharing material that for, for reasons that they have, they want to preserve in some whole fashion, some integral content integrity fashion? Are we, are, is our adherence to the five R's preventing that material from being shared and being fruitful and useful to others? That's an excellent question. And I think that's something to think about. And that would mean then rethinking the mantra of the five R's really is what we'll come down to. And then the last approach is to use workarounds, MacGyver solutions to the problem. So for example, just to show you a couple of quick uh, ways this could be done. So this is, this is a screenshot from the uh, Creative Commons website, and it just gives good wording, except for otherwise noted content on this site. And then, so you then would, in, in any material you're putting out there, say a, like a textbook through Pressbooks or something like that, you would uh, provide clear indications of the material, which is, you know, it's CC by, or you might say it's CC, yeah, CC by, but there are certain things that, you know, there are more, there are more restrictions or fewer permissions attached to them. Here's the, here they are, so that people know that clearly. This is done, for example, in the reverse using the CC by ND license that the conversation, which is, you might know this in your own country, uh, in Canada, the conversation.ca is a kind of a way for academics and university people to publish op-eds openly, and then these get published free of charge in other newspapers. New newspapers can pick these up. Anyone can pick these up and use them. You can use them in your courses too, of course. They're, but, they, but they have attached an attribution, no derivatives license. And the reason they've done that is that they want, they want to preserve the, the integrity of that 
of that opinion of that uh, work that the that the person is presenting in that um, excuse me in that op-ed piece but they provide some really clear guidelines about how to do that and I think that as a workaround if we use CC by and then provide clear guidelines that might be the approach anyways that's what I wanted to say um, I want to thank you for attending my uh, lecture uh, presentation. And um, you see my uh, uh, website there. You can find all of this, what you've just seen, the Padlet. All of that is is there on that on that uh, website. And I'll put this. I'll put that web address in the chat right as well, right away as well. So I'm going to stop sharing. I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'm happy to take any if people would like them. Thanks a lot, James, and and I encourage you as well to kind of put that up inside the OEG Connect space where yes, there's an area for your topic. Excellent. Um, and yes, there's some good discussion that took place in chat. I encourage you to check that out. Um, there's uh, yeah a variety of issues that were raised, and I, I think that it's an interesting topic of discussion. As and that is, you know, to what extent should the non-derivative license be, be considered an integral part of the OER community. I especially think it's relevant, uh, James, from my point of view, when it comes to learning that pertains to life and mission critical kinds of things. Like I used to do air traffic control and you don't want to have a non-derivative <laughs> license on that. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, no, I guess you don't. <laughs> But thank you so much. Um, just from a timing point of view, we now need to move on to yes, the next course. session.